Okay. All right, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. So now we have Costantino. Sorry, I did not get that really <laughs> wrong. <laughs> um, Hannah DeWalder. I'm so sorry. Yep, no, and Thomas Putsu uh, presenting on sustainability assessment of single stream and multi stream recycling. So take it away, guys. All right, I'm Thomas Putsu. I'm Costantino Berardocco. And I'm Hannah Delauder. Thank you guys all for coming. Uh, this is our project, Sustainability Assessment of Single Stream Recycling and Multi-Stream Recycling Systems. Um, our capstone advisor was Dr. Hao Zhang. I'm going to go over briefly our outline. So we had an introduction, methodology, and, uh, methodology analysis, and results. In our intro, we had the background, which I'll give you a brief description of the two systems that we're evaluating. Um, the current problem in the uh, current uh, literature in the research gap and our research objective. In the methodology, I'm going to define the goal and scope and go over our life cycle inventory. And in our analysis, we'll evaluate the economics comparison and env environmental impact comparison and sensitivity analysis. And then we'll briefly go over our conclusion and discussion. So a uh, little background, uh, our two systems are uh, multi-stream and recycling, uh, multi-stream recycling and single stream recycling. For multi-stream, you can see here, very similar to what we have here in JMU and uh, the trash cans even outside there, there are multiple bins for um, disposal. So uh, for example, paper, aluminum, uh, cans, and um, plastics all go into separate bins. So this requires um, manual separation by the participant or the consumer prior to being collected. So it involves multiple bins in commercial areas and also in homes if that is an option for curbside collection. Um, and it also requires com uh, compartmentalized trucks. So these collection trucks, rather than dumping it all into one area to maintain separation, they have um, different bins within those uh, trucks as well. As for single stream, it's like it says, single stream, so one stream of waste. So it's all commingled. All recyclable materials go into one bin. Um, and they're further separated at the MRF or material recovery facility. Um, Multi-stream are also further separated at the MRF, but it's a little simpler of a process. Um, and then we'll briefly show you a video on that process for single stream. Where recyclables go after they leave the curbside bins, the MRF sorts, processes, and bills these recyclables to be shipped to manufacturers. First, all the materials are unloaded and placed onto a conveyor belt in preparation for sorting. They then fall onto an incline spring and are sorted by gravity and shape. The paper products travel up the screen. While the paper products travel up, Containers fall back and through the screen onto a new conveyor that takes them to their next step in the sorting process. This process isn't foolproof. Workers sort out trash and misdirected recyclables by hand. This lessens the amount of contamination in the final recycling load. The paper products are dropped into a holding container that waits at the end of the conveyor, then bailed. Plastic bags are the number one problem at a MRF. While they are recyclable, a MRF can't process them. Take plastic bags to a grocery store, and they will take care of recycling those. The containers that previously rolled down and through the screen begin the next step with super strong magnets that attract steel. They pick steel products up and move them to another conveyor that delivers them to their appropriate holding container. Magnets don't attract aluminum. So it's sorted through a kind of reverse magnet called an eddy current, which shoots the aluminum products into a catch bin. Next, the heavier glass falls into a pit, while the lighter plastic materials float off the next conveyor belt for further sorting. The now broken glass, called colored, is then shipped to a glass recycling facility. Sometimes plastics are manually sorted, but more and more, this is done through optical sorting. This means the plastic is scanned and sorted by puffs of air into groups of type and color. Number one plastics are taken out of the process, stored, and bailed. Plastics the scanners don't pick up are further sorted by workers into specific groups. Plastics not removed during this process fall off the end of the conveyor into a pit to be shipped to plastic manufacturers. After all the materials have been sorted and processed, except for the glass, 
They are belled and can weigh anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Manufacturers buy these bells and create new products of that recycled material. Find out more at RecycleMoreNC.org. So, and then lastly, uh, single stream is a, a lot easier for uh, consumers and for participants. Um, so, recently, um, a lot more of state governments and county governments are, <laughs> are um, switching to single stream uh, due to increased waste diversion rates. So, um, to simplify that, they're mandating a certain recycling rate for their counties or states to meet, and single stream is assumed to have a higher recycling rate. Um, so a little benefit background. So multi-stream benefits inc uh, include decreased contamination. Um, so since the materials are separated prior, if you think about paper being mixed in with a soda can that might have residual soda or um, water in it, it can soil the materials and potentially deem them unusable. Um, so with that separation prior, um, it increases its value and quality um, of the recovered materials and makes them um, easier to use afterwards, um, which also uh, results in higher revenue with, when selling them in the end market. Um, with that also, relying on manual separation, you have a lower processing cost because you have um, a simpler process at the MRF or material recovery facility. Um, as for single stream, it's a lot, con a lot more convenient for the uh, users. So for example, if you're sitting, um, if you're buying food at festival and you're in line, how many of you have been confused as to what goes in what container? Um, because you're standing there, you're looking at the pictures, you're trying to figure out, well, there's cans on both of them, there's plastic on both of them. Um, it's very confusing, very um, hard, and a lot of times too, people are just like, well, uh, it doesn't matter, I'll just throw it into this one. So, Despite its convenience, it can also lead to contamination as well. So with single stream, it's a lot more convenient because there's no question about it. You all just dispose into one bin. Um, with that, there's a lot higher of a participation rate because there's no doubt as to which uh, material goes into which container. Um, and with that, there's a higher volume of materials recovered and lower collection costs uh, because of that. As for cons, uh, for multi-stream, there are a higher collection cost just because of the side-loading trucks because they need to maintain the separation um, throughout the whole process. Um, with that, there's also smaller available space in the trucks because of the, com uh, the compartments. Um, also, multiple containers discourage recycling. Um, like I said before, it's confusing. Um, it takes more time. It takes up space, especially in households. So if you think about even if the containers are supplied to them uh, free of cost, you're going to have three, four containers, and it takes up time, takes up money, um, and it's, like I said, confusing. Um, so with that, there's a lower participation rate, therefore lower um, recycling rate. Uh, as for single stream, like I said, higher contamination. So with all the materials placed into one bin, it causes uh, a lower quality and difficult finding end markets. So, and also with um, maybe waste of energy and labor and just time. So if you're processing all these materials and then you take them down to the end and they're deemed unusable, you're wasting a lot of time and energy separating these products and um, you know, transporting them back and forth. Um, with that, there's also an increased cost to mitigate and treat any of the uh, potential contamination. Um, also, there are higher operating and net costs. So in a study with Ontario, uh, Canada, for about 10 years, it was uh, calculated that single stream was expensive by nearly 30%. So our current problem is, um, especially in America, our increasing waste um, has forced us to result to different uh, uses of disposal and also just the trend of being green and recycling is encouraged. So with that, like I said, a lot of states and a lot of counties are mandating a certain recycling rate and um, with that, we, you know, with counties choosing a certain system over the other, we looked into this research gap where Research is very limited. Um, they might cover the economic standpoint and they might uh, cover the environmental standpoint, but not the whole life cycle as a whole. Um, so with that single versus multi-stream, we're looking into the economics and cost, environmental impacts, and social a uh, aspects such as participation. So as you can see here in this graph, we have various literatures and academics here 
and the various aspects that they touch on, such as upstream collection, transportation, MRF, which again is the material recovery facility where they separate these products, and end of life. So end of life is when um, all these materials are processed and then sold after market to be reused or repurposed. So as you can see in the orange, these are where uh, these are the aspects that these literatures touch on, and end of life is completely not touched on at all. So the whole life cycle assessment of these recyclables are not um, touched on at all. Um, the only one is right here, the Ontario study that I touched on. So this is where we found a research gap and where our project comes in to kind of fill that gap. Um, to properly assess a waste management system, in my <laughs> so our research objective is to investigate life cycle costs in greenhouse gas emissions or GHG emissions of single stream and multi-stream waste recycling systems, which include upstream collection, transportation, material uh, recycling processes, and end of life. So our goal here pretty much is to assist these governments or states into um, finding which system to adopt um, for their area and what they need, not so much of which is better of one over the other. We're not suggesting either one, but more so giving them that evaluation of um, economic costs, environmental impacts, and social aspects so they can make their own adjustment. Well, probably assess a waste management system. You must consider many aspects that affect the system. That's why we conduct a life cycle impact assessment that is broken into the goal and scope of definition of our project. A life cycle inventory and then environmental impact assessment, and these three j these three stages are interpreted between each other and individually. Uh, the 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 functional unit changes depending on what kind of uh, analysis we are conducting. For example, for the techno-economic analysis, the functional unit would be the U.S. dollars, while for the life cycle analysis, functional unit will be the C, uh, CO2 equivalents for greenhouse gas emission and everything will be compared to one ton of municipal solid waste. Our goal, uh, our goal at, at, at analyzing this variable is to determine whether single stream recycle multi multi stream. And the scope of this uh, assessment starts at the beginning of the collection of the waste and continues until the end of the life of the waste. Uh, Harrisonburg is divided into two systems. JMU, which adopts a multi-stream recycling system characterized by three main components paper, plastic, and organic waste. On the other end, the city itself, which uses a single stream recycling system characterized by other components, also characterized by recyclable and non-recyclable uh, components. Um, uh, these tables show the collection around Harrisonburg and uh, JMU, and uh, we use parameters such as number of trucks, distance travel per day, distance travel per year, all of this was useful to find the uh, environmental cost impact of collection on Harrisonburg, which helped us find the greenhouse gas emission, which were approximately uh, 300,000 kilograms of CO2 for JMU and 40,000 kilograms of CO2 for the city. Okay, so this is the single stream MRF process, so very similar to the video I showed you. Um, it looked super simplified in the video, but as you can see here, there's a lot of components that go into it. So the waste is uh, taken in here, and like the video showed, goes onto a conveyor and disc screen. So this is the main, um, the main stream of waste, and it's separated throughout these ends here. And at once each material is moved out, it's baled. So um, this is where cardboard is removed, and paper is removed here, and plastic bags into bunkers and baled. It's uh, continued down using gravity, so glass will fall and break into a bin, and then the other materials continue on. Um, and further, paper is removed using um, uh, an air knife, so like those air jets that you saw in the video. Um, and then plastics are removed using the optical scanners here, and magnets for steel cans, and um, then mag and a magnetic field or an eddy current is used to remove the aluminum, um, and any other waste is further uh, used uh, and separated using manual separation and any other waste is either taken to the landfill or um, incinerated to recover energy. So there are some few things about this table I'd like to draw your attention to. The first is the utilization. This is the utilization rate of the machines that are in the material recovery facility, the MRF. Um, so the utilization rate 0.85, that means that it's used approximately 85% of the time that that facility is operational processing the waste. And one means that it is used 100% of the time that the facility is operational. 
They also like to draw your attention to the energy kilowatt hours per ton. So this is pretty much the energy that it takes for the entire process to process one ton of that material. And I'd also like to draw your attention to the operation section. And as you can see, it is broken up for single stream. It's, it's uh, one big bin. So um, you can tell that it's, you know, when it goes through the system, it's one ton of commingled materials. It's uh, not broken up at all. And now the multi-stream MERF process, uh, uh, very similar, um, although it's a lot more simplified because single stream has a lot more added mechaniz uh, mechanizations because it is not separated at all prior. Um, so very similar, it comes through the conveyor, then disc screens, and that's um, corrugated cardboard that goes through. And then it continues on with the glass breaker and then the, the jets, the air jets, optical scanners for the plastics, uh, magnets for the steel, and then the eddy current for the aluminum, and they are all bailed and taken to their end of life. So the, Oops, so the thing I would like to draw your attention to on this table is the operations. As you could tell from before, it's different from single stream. It's broken up into the container and the fiber stream. This is because when people go and throw away their waste, they're supposed to manually separate it, so the waste is already supposed to have a great degree of separation. Uh, the end of life cycle is where we can analyze how much greenhouse gas emissions are being saved as well as the overall efficiency of the system. Uh, this table shows the unit cost, which is usually subject to change based on the market value of the, com of the waste, of the material, and also the emission factor, which is uh, the greenhouse gas emi emission in kilograms of CO2 per ton that are being saved. This is also the stage where we can sell a refined material to create revenue to make the, pro uh, the system run. All right, so this is our economics comparison for Harrisonburg between single stream and multi-stream. All these numbers are relative per ton of uh, municipal solid waste. Um, as was expected, the multi-stream collection is a little bit higher than single stream because of the side loading trucks and the compartmentalization. And as you can see, the MRF is slightly higher for single stream because of the, you know, the additional processes that must be done to the waste in order to separate them fully. However, in the end of life stage, um, you can see that because single stream um, recycles more waste as a higher participation rate, that it actually um, increases profit uh, more than multi-stream. All right, so I'm gonna go over the environmental impact uh, so green, we're using greenhouse gas emissions of single stream versus multi-stream. Our unit is kilograms of carbon dioxide per ton of waste. Um, so here, collection is relatively the same. Um, we're going to focus more so on uh, end of life and the material recovery facility. So for the material recovery facility, single stream is about twice at 30 versus uh, 14.76 kilograms of carbon dioxide. This is due to that added um, mechanizations and added energy um, to separate out those single streams. So you're really relying on that prior separation to cut down that cost and um, in the greenhouse gas emissions. So for here, end of life, you'll see that single stream is significantly lower in the negatives of greenhouse gas emissions um, versus multi-stream here. So um, at around 818 versus um, 243. Uh, to determine the pressure points of the system, uh, the system uh, reacts to variation in inputs. We conducted a sensitivity analysis to determine how accurate our data and our results depict to the system. We analyzed four different variables within the entire Harrisonburg uh, waste management system, which are collection components, MRF, and the end of life for the waste are going to show us, uh, uh, sure, the lifts are going to show us uh, what they are going to show us what the system is, how the system is going to react when there's changes in input. I'm sorry. Uh, for uh, the components, so JMU's population has increased uh, by 1,517 students just over the past year. That doesn't mean that this many students is going to create an equal amount of waste, but it's going to create an increase in percentage of total waste produced. So if we increase our, 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 um, if we increase our waste by 10% for every, for every new thousand students at JMU, in our situation, we have uh, 1,500 students, so if you increase your waste by 15%, we will end up with a, uh, next slide please, we will end up with a total of 55,000 ton of total waste produced, and this also shabled, uh, this table also show the components of, uh, the, the, the three different components with a 15% increase each. Okay, 
So um, another manipulation we uh, addressed was collection. So the total distance to the MRF is around Charlottesville at, at around 74.3 miles. So that can be seen right here. So the total uh, greenhouse, uh, the CO2 kilograms of carbon dioxide per ton was at 10.56. So we lowered and hired that uh, uh, distance to see how it, it changed the greenhouse gas emissions. So for at the low at 64.3 miles, which would be about 10 miles south down 81 at um, Stanton, just to see that where that's where an applicable MRF could be, um, the greenhouse gas emissions would be 9.33, and then we um, increased it to about 104 miles, and you can see here at 14.22, which would be around Richmond, Virginia. Okay, so I'd like to talk about the statistical analysis for the material recovery facility. So changes in the amount of material passing through the system, as well as costs of the energy, um, affect the outputs of the MRF um, in terms of kilowatt hours and costs. Um, to test the difference, there's a need to manipulate these variables to see um, how sensitive the system is and the pressure points within the system. So here you can see the kilowatt hours necessary to run single and multi-stream. As you can see, they were very similar to start with. The original, they were both about 18, with single stream needing a little bit more for those additional processes. And when we raised, um, when we raised these parameters, we saw that it really didn't raise the system that much um, between the utilization rate and the amount of material passing through and um, everything. So it really didn't increase that much increase um, between about a point for each one, <laughs> half a point for uh, multi-stream. However, when you lower these uh, utilization rate and the amount of material passing through, uh, the kilowatt hours do drop a significant amount, about four kilowatt hours. So here is the energy costs um, to process one ton of NSW. So this is why we did the sensitivity analysis is for results like these. Our original hypothesis was that you know single stream was going to be way more to you know, operate than um, multi-stream. However, when we plugged these numbers into our model and manipulated them, um, we saw that multi-stream really increased and the increase in the utilization rate for single stream means that more material could pass through the system in the same amount of time. So um, the amount it would cost the actual, you know, the material recovery facility to operate those machines dropped. Um, and as you can see, uh, it was very subject to change. Um, it increased by about a point for multi-stream and by almost a full point, decreased by almost a full point for single stream. Okay, so now we're gonna touch on the end of life phase. And this is the last phase of the recycling process. So this is after they're all bailed and now um, they're selling them. Um, so the companies that would have bought, you know, fresh raw materials that got, you know, taken out from the ground or however, the materials would be recovered. This is how much, um, you know, how much money and how much greenhouse gas emissions that they're saving by using this recycled materials. And the changes of variables related to the end of life stage have an impact on the environment and the revenue from single and multi-stream. So here's a table. I'll show you a vi visual graph in a little bit. But here are numbers for basically our gross annual revenue for um, the end of life uh, low and the end of life high, and for the kilograms of carbon saved from the systems. So again, this is why we did the sensitivity analysis. Um, kilograms of carbon saved from recycling, so this is aggregate um, over uh, like an annual period. It's not uh, relative to the ton, such as was our other functional units. Um, and as you can see here, multi-stream really um, outperformed single stream in terms of the kilograms of carbon saved from like the environment. Um, and the same thing's applicable here, uh, has a much higher annual revenue from single and multi-stream. Um, doing the sensitivity analysis is really able to show how, um, like how the pressure points in our system and how it can be manipulated or changed to, uh, to show us um, how accurate our results were. All right. Then I'll go over our conclusions. So um, our administrative cost for single stream recycling is slightly lower than multi-stream recycling. The MRF processing cost is higher for single stream recycling. The greenhouse gas emissions is, like we showed earlier, um, higher for single stream in collection and in the MRF stages. And the developed model can be used to evaluate economics and greenhouse gas emissions for the two recycling systems. So this is where we're uh, using this to not only um, show our analysis, but not to suggest for them, but just so they can um, make a decision for themselves.
So we discussed that single stream recycling revenue is higher than multi stream recycling compared to the studies in 2015, as we saw earlier. The single stream recycling rate, which is the city recycling rate, is around 37%, while the JMU recycling rate is between 43 and 48%. Uh, greenhouse gas emission is higher for single stream than multi stream. And honestly, the results can depends on the components and uh, the a bit how much how much air you have for separating this material and the MRF. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about the limitations in the future research. So our data accuracy really needs to be improved. It took us a long time to collect this data, and it took us basically bugging the hell out of the city to actually give us all this data. Um, so in the future, we need to you know get our numbers updated. The numbers that we were working with were from. Um, I, I don't remember if it was 2015 or 2016, the published data, but it is not um, current, like up to date um, of what is currently going on in the system. And also due to the scope and system boundary of our project, non-recyclable wastes were eliminated, so that will have an impact on the system um, due to, you know, contamination and non-recyclable waste. Um, for future research, we need to revise our model um, in order to get more accurate results. That ties in with, you know, the data accuracy that needs to be improved. Um, took us, you know, most of a year and a half to do this analysis and get all this data in order to get a good result and conduct the sensitivity analysis. Um, yeah, correct the data, <coughs> and then we need to update the sensitivity analysis in order for us to, you know, do further research and try to see where other pressure points might be within the system that could affect the cost in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and also an uncertainty analysis so we can see, you know, how close to the actual result, like the true state of the system we are with our result. Okay, and we'd just like to acknowledge and thank our capstone advisor, Dr. Hao Zhang, uh, for mentoring us and helping us through this process and teaching us his ways. We'd also like to thank JMU um, and Harsit Patel, who worked for the Public Works Department, who helped us get all this information. Without him, we would not have the data. And also Jason Rexroad, who's in charge of the recycling at JMU. And um, this work has also been presented in the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers International Annual Meeting in Spokane, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I hope you understand that if you go back to the, the number of the recycling rate for Harrisburg single stream, it's shockingly low. Um, and I say that for two reasons, maybe you can help me understand this. I, I know a township in New Jersey has a hybrid system, so the garbage goes one way, and all the recyclables are combined. And 25 years ago, that township reached 65% recycling. Okay? Mm -hmm. A single stream recycling with combined with, with ordinary waste, in principle, should be 100%. Right? So why is it, what is it, 37% or? Was that oh, I can actually, um, yeah, it's 37%. Uh, so it like the city and JMU and the third party, we did, like, we didn't do the city of Harrisonburg. We did all of Harrisonburg. So that includes JMU and a lot of third parties. So a lot of the student housing outsources their recycling and their trash to third party. And some of which them don't even recycle. Yeah, which gets taken. So Harrisonburg uh, has okay. to report their number as if they're recycling 100% of the waste here. Mm -hmm. However, they're not actually getting 100% so of the waste. So Harrisonburg City simply collected from all this off-campus housing. Their so recycling rate would be higher. Stream, then yeah. it will be higher. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking to that, Harrisonburg is no longer doing single stream, right? They've, they've lost their contract. Yeah. That's what I heard. So yeah. I agree yeah. that too. Well, and also, I don't know if you are familiar with Vanderlyn. Vanderlyn just changed in the beginning of March that they're no longer going to be accepting recyclables and or, or, or waste and getting recyclables out of that. Um, so very unfortunate. Um, on that note, was your data modeled after previously conducted research, or were you conducting your own with like kilowatt meters? In facilities like Vanderland. It was it was previously conducted research that was peer reviewed. Okay, yeah. so the, that when Vanderland changed had no bearing on. Peer yeah, we didn't get yeah. any. It was very hard to get data from Vanderland. They um, yeah, they wouldn't respond. Yeah, yeah, they were very very closed off. Yeah. 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 They didn't want people to see their processes. Mm -hmm. um, of of the many um, people you, you worked with, who, who was the most I guess um, 
not helpful in Vanderland. Okay. Vanderland. They did. They like did not even respond. <laughs> yeah, they ignored a lot of my yeah. calls. They would pick up the phone sometimes and then hang up on me when I told them what I was. Yeah, I even tried to. Um, I'm an intern and I tried to reach out to them for to do business with them. So we would pay them, and they still wouldn't even respond. So <laughs> very difficult. <laughs> The single stream compared to the multi stream has the possibility of more waste because of the resi residual uh, contamination of multiple mm -hmm. different things as well. Was that put into the end as a, as a possibility of the revenue becoming smaller in the sense if like multiple people are, okay, let's say it's a college campus, there's going to be beer. If beer and homework is thrown out together, like most likely the paper is not going to be soluble. So. Right. In that situation, has that been considered as well? And second, do you guys, I know you're looking at it from a geographical standpoint, do you guys look at it from like a demographic growth as well? Like if a university comes into the area, it would have a different impact on the outcome than it would be if it was a residential area, like a suburban area that's growing in that way. All right, so the answer to your first question is yes, we did consider the aspect of contamination in those numbers. Um, although we did get a lot of the rates for contamination and like percentage recycling from single stream from peer-reviewed articles. So that's the data we use. To answer your um, second question, we did analyze that. That was the, you know, the increase in the JMU's population. Um, so it's increasingly difficult to educate people, um, especially college students, on recycling because, because they're, they're switching every They're every new year, every right. four years. So yeah, you, even my job switches. Like, right. We have multiple. We had to throw it in compost. Papers, like, like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Right. Well, you can recycle paper, and some papers can be compostable. It's exactly. very, very difficult. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and a lot of times they just don't care. Um, so that's the that's the thing too with with multi-stream, where you have to really rely on the compliance of the users, and it's hard to put a number on that, though. Yeah. Um, other than that's like more of the social aspect where we're trying to tie it all in, where maybe that's a reason why these numbers are lower or higher because of that. So. Anyone else? Thank you.